Psalm 33 in the Word of God is a summons to God's people to have hearts that are filled with joy. As you and I enter this new year, the Lord does want for you and me to have joy in our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit who speaks to us in Psalm 33, beginning in verse 1, and he addresses all of us who are righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. And he says to us, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. He's speaking, beloved, to you and me. Rejoice in the Lord. Whatever you do, the Holy Spirit says in the new year, whatever you do, make sure that you rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. For praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the heart. Make melody to him with an instrument of Ten strings sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. And then there are reasons why you and I should rejoice in the Lord. Dropping down to verse 10, you think of godless nations and their plans. And I personally think of so often the United Nations and their anti-Semitism. To remember this truth about God. Verse 10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. They may have their counsel and their plans. But God, if he chooses, will resist it and stop it in its traps. And rejoice in the Lord in that truth. But also verse 11. And to remember that God is the most high. And to remember to rejoice in the plan of God. And he says, the counsel of the Lord, his plan which embraces all things without exception. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. And you look at the plan again. There are parts to that plan. And so he moves to the plural. The plans of his heart to all generations. The plan of God will be achieved and affected in this new year. You can count on it. And rejoice in the Lord. The psalmist says to you and me who are the righteous. Now we're thinking today about the plan of God. And point number one, the importance of the plan. We see that first in Psalm 33, in a psalm of praise. But now let's turn to the book of Ephesians. And we're going to be in Ephesians a fair amount this morning. Where you have the apostle giving a doxology and praising God. And this underscores the importance of the plan of God. He begins in Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He blesses God for all of these things that he has done and is doing. And then as we drop down to verse 11, he brings to our attention the plan of God. And he says that in him, that is, as you and I are united to Jesus Christ through faith in him, we are joined to him, united to him, 
We have this wonderful blessing. He says, in him also we have obtained an inheritance. Past tense. It's so certain. You and I have obtained eternal life. Why is that? What is the ultimate reason why you and I have obtained eternal life? Here it is, verse 11. Being predestined, destined ahead of time by God to obtain eternal life. Predestined. Now, Calvin did not write that word here in Ephesians 1.11. That was the Apostle Paul who wrote that word. As you well know. Being predestined according to the purpose of him. It was God's purpose that we would have this inheritance. Revelation 21. We read it earlier. You need to remember this in the new year. As we think about all of the events of history... It is not chaos. It is not random. It is not chance. It is not luck. That is an unbiblical term. It is not random. Nothing is random. All things are certain to happen. And notice with me what Paul says. In verse 11, about God, he's mentioned the purpose of him. God who works in, it's better rendered that way in the Greek, God is working in, working in what? A few things or some things or most things. God, he says, is working in all things, all comprehensive all embracive. He is working in all things according to the counsel, according to the plan of God's will. God's will unifies all events and presents logic to all events. And this is the truth about reality. Paul blesses God and thanks God for the truth of his will, his counsel, his plan. He thanks God that he is working in all things. This is a very important subject. Notice with me in your outline... The importance of the plan first, giving thanks for the plan. Second, Paul's preaching of the counsel of God. Just stick your bulletin, if you would, there in that Ephesians 1 passage. And let's move over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, Paul is addressing the elders in the church in Ephesus, and he had worked closely with these men for three years. And he is in Miletus, which is south of Ephesus, on the western coast of what is today Turkey. And he calls for the elders to come. He's going to say goodbye to these men. He's headed to Jerusalem. He knows this is the grand finale. This is the last time that he will see them here in this world. And so we come to Acts chapter 20 and verse 17, and Luke writes this. He says, From Miletus he, talking about Paul, sent to Ephesus, had called for the elders of the church, and when they had come to him, he said to them. And then you have this address. I'm sure we've all read this address. There are times when there is great and profound emotion among the people of God, which we are not Stoics. Thank God we reject Stoicism, a false philosophy of the ancient world. And you'll note something of the scene here as you drop down to the end of the address in verse 36, Acts 20, 36. And when he had said these things, the address is now completed. Here's the summary. Who knows? Maybe it lasted a couple of hours. 
He knelt down and prayed with them all. And this is the rejection of Stoicism. You don't find Stoicism in the Word of God. You don't find it in Jesus. You don't find it in the apostles. You don't find it in the elders. You don't find it in the men of God in the Bible. Not at all. Verse 37. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. Now that's a Middle, Middle Eastern type approach there. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And this is right on the seashore in Miletus, if you look on a map. And they accompanied him to the ship. And Paul summarizes his ministry. What is a biblical ministry anyway? Well, you have to look at people like Paul. He shows us how to do it. And you'll note this remarkable statement that he makes in the midst of the address, Acts chapter 20. And notice verse 26. We should all as preachers aim at this in particular. We should all aim at this in another sense. We are accountable. We will stand before God. I will. You will. To give an account. And Paul can say this. In verse 26, Therefore I testify to you this day. His conscience is clear. Standing before God saying this, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. No one's blood will be on my hands on that day. And here's the reason. Verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He had some biblical manhood. He was not afraid to declare the truth of God's plan to the church in Ephesus. Now you'll note this bulletin insert here, which I have, the teaching of Paul, the whole counsel of God. I believe that this is what he is saying here when he says that I have not shunned to declare to you the history of salvation, the whole plan of God. This plan which I have put together comes from Paul's writings. And you piece it all together, the kind of things that Paul taught. And, you know, if we had a couple of hours, which we don't, we could talk about this. This would be great for Sunday school sometime. But the whole sweep of the history of salvation and God's activities would be laid out by the Apostle Paul as to what God is doing in his counsel, starting on the far left with Adam, the first man who sinned and brought death. And then the second man, moving over a little bit to the right, the second Adam comes and goes to the cross and dies is buried, is raised again, who goes into heaven. And this second man, Jesus Christ, is, as you can see across the top and coming down again, he is coming again to bring his eternal kingdom into this world. The whole sweep of history laid out by Paul in his writings. And this, this is all pieced together. He would have taught, moving over to the left again, about the covenant made with the Jews that the Jews are broken off, we Gentiles are grafted in, but the Jews will come back in again near the end of history, Romans chapter 11. This whole sweep of the history of salvation, all laid out to the congregation in Ephesus. And thus he's free from the blood of all men. But there's more to it. Look at Acts chapter 20, still in this address. And beginning in verse 18, we're reminded of the fact that there is suffering. There is difficulty when you and I are in this work. 
And you see that in particular in the life of Paul. This is not a piece of cake trying to minister the word of God anywhere, any place in this world for any of us. In verse 18, and when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, the Roman province of Asia there in western Turkey, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord. Now, look at this beautiful description of this theological genius, this man of God who performed miracles, signs and wonders and miracles. And yet, the conduct of this great man of God Serving the Lord with all humility. Isn't that beautiful? And you know, he says, that it was true. You know it was true. That's how I lived among you. With humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. So I kept back nothing that was helpful. Laid it all out. But proclaimed it to you and taught, it, it taught you publicly from house to house. Now here's the thing. We don't want to miss this. There's always an invitation to enter this flow of salvation. Back to the chart here. An invitation to step into this flow of salvation and not to miss it. Look at verse 21, if you would. This is where Paul would bring it home, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God, a change of mind, a change of thinking, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Always that invitation to be saved, free from the blood of all men. Because he preached the plan of God. See how important this is, the plan of God? Now, let's come to our second point. The making of God's plan. I ask you to turn back to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. The sovereign freedom of God. The sovereign freedom of God. Now, this divides, as you know, the Christian community. Not you, but the Christian community. So many do not believe what Paul says very clearly in this passage. Let's look at it together. Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> All of these blessings come as they're in Christ like spokes in a wheel. Sinclair Ferguson puts it that way. Spokes in a wheel. All blessings come in Christ. Notice that. We're going to catch some of that here at the beginning of the doxology. Ephesians 1. Let's begin in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. There it is, the first one. The blessings come in Christ. Now, are you ready? You know this text well. Let's go back before creation. Way, 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 way back before Genesis 1, 1. Way back. What was going on then? Verse 4. Just as he chose us, in him, election in Christ. When? Before the foundation of the world. Why did he choose us? He wants you and me, beloved, to be a very unusual, special people by the grace of God over time. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Here it is. That we should be holy and without blame before him. You and I are going to be perfectly holy when we see God. 
I know I don't feel holy right now. Do you? But we are going to be holy before God. Now he's not done. Just in case we think he's done, he's not. Look at what he says. In love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. There it is again, predestination. Be God's sons. Now, what is the operating principle of the predestination? Is it the foreknowledge of faith, as the Arminians teach? No, look at what Paul says. According to the good pleasure of his will, according to the kind intention of his will, that's why he predestined us to become his sons. He had a kind intention toward us, a kind intention because he loved us. Notice again, verses 4 and 5, the linkage there. In love, having predestined us. That was his motivation, that he looked down and he loved us and had a kind intention and predestined us to adoption as sons. Sovereign freedom of God, not forced. Back of the outline. Take a look. This is in the, um, the, uh, the book that we have in the, the pew, but just turn the outline over to the other side for just a moment. You remember that the Arminians in the early 1600s had real problems with this text. And there was an international reform conference in the Netherlands uh, in the city of Dort, the Synod of Dort met and came up with this marvelous statement, which we believe. And let me just direct your attention to a few of the statements, and you can see they're basically lifted from Paul in Ephesians 1. Look at Article 9 there at the top. This election was not founded upon foreseen faith in the obedience of faith, holiness, or any other good quality or disposition in man as the prerequisite cause or condition on which it depended. No, yeah. Teaching of Arminius is wrong at that point. Move down to Article 10. This is lifted right from Ephesians 1.5. The good pleasure of God or the kind intention of God is the idea. The good pleasure of God is the sole cause of this gracious election. That's right from Ephesians 1, 5. You drop down to the fourth line. He selects some out of the common mass of sinners to adopt some certain persons as a peculiar people to himself. What an amazing thing. If you believe in Jesus, this is true. <clears throat> For you. Now, how do we respond to all of this? How should you and I respond today? Well, drop down to Article 13, and I really think this is right on target. And you and I ask, oh Lord, I haven't been a good person. I've done a lot, lot of things that are I shouldn't have done. I'm amazed that you've chose me. I'm really amazed. Look at Article 13. The sense and certainty of this election afford to the children of God additional matter for daily humiliation before him. Think about you and I going through the new year and remembering this truth of election. I really should have a daily humiliation before God I really should be amazed third line for adoring the depth of his mercies 
and rendering grateful returns of ardent love to him who first manifested so great love towards them. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you. And I want to love you because you loved me. You've always loved me. And I want to love you in return. That's what it's saying here. Very good, very good teaching. Last point. The making of God's plan. A plan that always was. Never began. Does the Bible really teach that? Turn over to Ephesians 3. Logically, it would have to teach that. Logically. Because God knows all things. The plan would have to be embraced in an omniscient mind and always to have been there. Logically, it must be the case. But biblically, it is certain that that is the case. God's plan being unfolded in history, and Paul lays out some of the things that God's doing here in Ephesians 3. You and I are now equal to the Jews in the body of Christ. That is a mystery not revealed in the past, but revealed now in the first century. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Now here, here's the great truth about you and me. God began this in the first century that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. You and I are equal to the Jews. We're not second class citizens. Equal to the Jews in the body of Christ. Isn't that amazing? God loves us so much. Here's another thing. Saul of Tarsus, who tried to destroy the church, now is our apostle. He is our apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles. Look at what he says here in Ephesians 3. And this is a major thing in God's plan, the, the place of Paul. Ephesians 3.8. And I wonder today, beloved, what you're thinking about yourself. I, I don't know anybody's heart. I just know mine to some little degree. Okay, a little, little degree. What you think about yourself. This is a very good self-assessment. If you have this this morning, praise God. Look at what he says about himself in Ephesians 3 and verse 8. To me who am less than the least of all the saints. You take all of the saints. You take the least of all of the saints. Millions and millions and millions and millions of saints. And I am less than the least. Beautiful. Look at the privilege he was given to me who am less than the least of all the saints. This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now here's another thing that's happening. The angels of God are always watching the church. We can't see them. But they're always observing. And they see the wisdom of God in the church. Look, look at verse 10. I'm just going to jump into this. He says that to the intent that now, this is a new development in the flow of history, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. They look at us, probably here this morning, looking at us. 
they see the manifold wisdom of God in the church. Something happening in history. So you have all these things happening in history, happening in your life, my life. He mentioned some of these things. God's moving, God's acting, doing wonderful things in history. Now we come to the text. Look at Ephesians 3 and verse 11. We've just mentioned three things in the text. Now Paul has this explicit statement about the plan and the purpose of God. You see it? According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is an eternal plan. Always in the mind, the intellect of God. Always decreed by God. So that's our assurance in the new year. It will be the unfolding of God's eternal purpose for you and for me. All things work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose.